So thank you all for, for taking the time to join us. We'll just get our, our slide deck up now for the presentation. Mo, if you can bring that up. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us uh, today, regardless of which time zone you're in. Welcome to this webinar that's that's a part of our electrification series. Today we'll be going over traction motor performance degradation due to demagnetization. Uh, in specific, we'll be addressing the effect of, of gradual demagnetization on the on the motor power density and performance, as well as going into prediction of, of permanent magnets demagnetization, uh, demagnetization, excuse me, due to load conditions, thermal conditions, as well as operations under fault conditions. We're excited to have a, an esteemed group of co-presenters who I'll be introducing shortly. Before we get to that, just a couple of housekeeping items for all of you. First and foremost, this is meant to be an interactive webinar where we will have short polling questions throughout the presentation. So we look forward to your input. You will find it as part of the polling feature once we make the questions themselves available. However, if you have questions or clarifications or have any issues with audio or the presentation material, Please don't hesitate to ask them in the question feature within GoToWebinar. Uh, we'll aim to address those during the presentation. However, if we are unable to, um, we'll, we'll be sure to either do it at the end or connect with you afterwards in case we run out of time. Please also note that the presentation material will be shared by email following this webinar. Uh, we will also be sharing a recording of the presentation itself. So with that, we'll go ahead and do a quick round of introductions. First and foremost, uh, my name is Daniel Mazar, and I'll be your host for this webinar. I'm responsible for, for customer success and sales operations for, for Maya HGT. I'll introduce Maya a little bit later uh, in the presentation, but right now what I'm doing is I, I leverage my electrical engineering background and supporting clients across North America on complex engineering and digitalization challenges. Joining us for this presentation, we're very excited to have uh, Professor David Lowther, who is a professor at McGill University. Uh, he's also the president of the International CompuMag Society, as well as being one of the founders of the Infolitica Corporation, the authors of the Magnet and MotorSolve product line. His research includes computer-aided design of low-frequency electromagnetic devices, with a particular emphasis on electric machines, actuators, and transformers, plus a coupling to power electronic drives as well as thermal structural and vibration analysis. <laughs> so he's, uh, he's doing quite a bit. Uh, he's also a fellow of the Canadian Ac Academy of Engineering, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering, and the Institute of Engineering and Technology. And a small fun fact, he was my one of my professors when I was at McGill University doing my engineering degree. So very excited to have him uh, be here with us today. In addition, we have my colleague, Mohamed Omer. Mohamed is one of our senior technical pre-sales engineers at Maya for all of your electrification needs. Mo has years of experience with a variety of electrification tools, whether we're looking at integrated electrical systems, EMAG, ECAD, and is consistently appreciated for the immense value he adds by peers and clients alike. So we're all excited to, to be here with you. I will be hosting this webinar, as I mentioned, but the majority of the content will be coming from Professor Lauther as well as from Mo. Great. Excuse me. As I mentioned, this is part of a, a broader series that we're doing. Uh, we had our initial session on solving the challenges of electrical complexity, uh, where we had one of our, our customers present as, as well as one of our subject matter experts. Uh, we strongly recommend you look at the material there if you or one of your colleagues is interested in learning more. If you do not have access to that material, please send us a note and we will be sure to make it available to you afterwards. Today, we're going on to the second of these webinars I mentioned. We're looking at e-motor performance degradation. Um, next week, we're going to have another session right after the uh, American Thanksgiving holidays where we'll talk about more on, on systems, subsystems, integration in the full vehicle context, and also some component sizing. And then finally, there's going to be a fourth and last session that's going to be based on attendee input. So we'll be releasing some polling around there, but you tell us what you'd like to learn a little bit more on, and we'd be happy to put something together for you there as well. <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, Mo and I both work as, as part of Maya HTT, and Maya is the one hosting this webinar. 
So we are a leading provider of digital engineering solutions and the number one global partner for Siemens digital industry software. We started off and our history is predominantly in aerospace, but we've been working with a plethora of industries and complex engineering challenges over the last three decades. Uh, in particular, we're seeing immense growth around the challenges and adoption related to vehicle electrification with clients that we have working on cutting edge problems uh, all over the world, particularly near our offices in the US, Canada, and the UK. Today, we're covering a small subset of our expertise and, and bringing in certain subject matter experts, but there's a lot more that we're able to help different organizations with, whether we're looking at design, uh, simulation, or computer aided engineering, going from design to manufacturing, additive manufacturing, uh, even looking at traceability and compliance related uh, needs with product lifecycle management. So there's a lot that we can do. You know, AI itself is a great example where we're looking at machine learning algorithms and being able to help our company, our clients that are working on, on digitalization efforts and, and, and data gathering efforts. So many different things that, that are available here. I just wanted to make note that today we're only covering a small subset, but if any of these are of interest or if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what we're doing for automation or some custom applications or workflow modification, don't hesitate to send us a note and we'd be able to help address that as well. So with that, I think we're ready to kick off our presentation and I'll pass it over to Mo, who's gonna bring us through the first segment. Go ahead, Mo. Thank you very much, Dan, and thank you for the amazing introduction. I'll make sure the next session to record it and use it as my uh, ringtone. Thank you very much. Okay, Anytime. so... <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. My name is Mohammed Omar and in this presentation we will look at the degradation of uh, permanent magnet traction motors due to demagnetization. Uh, however, this analysis is not only applicable to traction motors but it applies to all machines using permanent magnets uh, like uh, motors, generators, pumps and actuators. To start off, we're going to start by uh, giving a very brief introduction into the trends and challenges of vehicle electrification. And I know most of you uh, on the line are already experts in the domain, so I won't bore you with the details. Uh, from there, I'm gonna pass it along to uh, Professor Lauder, who's gonna take us through the modern, uh, the design of modern electrical machines. And from there, we're gonna discuss the motor life service and the factors affecting the performance of the motor life and the surface of the, motor, of, uh, the electric motor. And uh, from there, we're gonna jump into the details with uh, um, breaking down the technical roadmap for our design and uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. And uh, from there, we're gonna discuss the multi-physics designs and conclude the webinar. So uh, when we talk about vehicle electrification, vehicle electrification, we have to start out by looking, some of, uh, looking at some of the key trends in ground transportation, which make uh, product innovation critical to remain competitive. Uh, first, the, the recent Paris Agreement was signed by over 190 countries committing to, re to reversing the greenhouse gases emissions. About a quarter of those emissions come from the transport industry, and stricter regulations are planned well into the future, making it a challenge for new competitive vehicle designs. Also, conventional combustion engines alone will not be able to achieve the future of emission levels. By optimizing the performance of the current combustion engines, we may be able to achieve target goals for the next generation vehicles. However, to go beyond those limits, new innovative ideas need to be implemented to achieve future regulations. Simultaneously, we need to incorporate new ideas and innovative ideas and engineers must be able to bring those concepts to the market as quickly as possible while still reducing the cost to, to remain competitive in the domain. And it's a, 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 nowadays the automotive industry and vehicle electrification is an extremely challenging market that requires uh, uh, cutting edge uh, ideas and innovative concepts for a competitive product. Uh, with that, I pass it along to Professor Lauder who's gonna take us and talk to us about the, uh, the design of modern electric vehicles in uh, the electric, uh, electrification and vehicle electrification domain. Uh, Professor, I'm going to give you control. Yes. 
Okay, thanks, Mo, and, and thanks, Daniel, for that amazing introduction. I was wondering who you were talking about um, to start with. <laughs> uh, but apparently, it's me. Okay, well, well, good, good afternoon, everybody. For those of you in Eastern Time Zone and whatever time it is, wherever you are, welcome. Um, just to follow on, because Daniel introduced me from McGill. Um, I've got lots of different hats, and, and sort of part of the hat I have today is, is McGill, but I'm also a, a technical director at uh, the Mentor Mechanical Analysis Division, and of course, Mentor is part of Siemens uh, these days, and uh, so I'm partly presenting stuff from Siemens and partly presenting ideas from McGill. The, the goal of this uh, few minutes segue into Mo's actually really amazing talk, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Um, is just to try to put a bit of background in, give you a few fun facts, talk a little bit about what the issues are on the design of, of modern machines. And it's a bit of a presumptive title saying that there are such things as modern electrical machines as opposed to just electrical machines. Um, so what I really would like to do in the few minutes we've got today is to talk about electrification. I'm sure everybody on this call, uh, you wouldn't be here if you weren't worrying about electrification and electrical machines. But uh, I thought I'd just do a quick review of that and uh, bring everybody up to date. And then talk about where electrical machines appear. The goal of uh, this talk, of course, is to worry about, or this webinar is to worry about transportation. But that's not um, the only place electrical machines are run. And then I want to talk a little bit about what's forcing some of the design techniques for electrical machines to, to change. Um, because one question is, why are we changing things when they've worked quite well for about 150 years? Um, what's the rationale on changing? And so let's look at what, uh, what's forcing these changes and these needs. And then talk uh, at the end uh, about multi-physics aspects of electrical machines and, and why they're really true multi-physics devices, more so than, than many systems and uh, uh, we use uh, in the world. So, and that hopefully will segue into to Mo's um, talk. So that, that's where we're going, and I will try not to keep you um, tied to this too long. So I think we're all aware, and, and um, Mo mentioned it a few moments ago, that there's a massive push in the world to go electric. Um, in all sorts of senses in order to reduce emissions to improve the world we live in and so on. And this image basically is meant to give you some idea of what we mean by go electric. Um, you can start with power generation uh, through transformers, distribution systems, uh, through high voltage mainline transmissions, uh, down to the local distribution, from distribution into factories, into residential, systems and so on. The whole point here is that going electric means we have a very flexible and simple way of moving energy around the world. We don't need great oil pipelines um, or trucks carrying stuff. We can move energy relatively easily from point A to point B. So we get a, a clean energy, a clean method for energy conversion, uh, assuming that you think that the generation system over here is relatively clean. Um, and down here where we're using it in the house, we're turning it back into something more useful because in general, electromagnetic energy is not very much use for anything directly. It gets converted into other forms in order to be usable. And so we tend to convert it um, from thermal, chemical, and mechanical uh, into electromagnetics and then back again because at the end of the day, we operate in a three-dimensional physical universe where most things are mechanical. So as we increase the global demand for energy, it's really important that we use the stuff as effectively as possible. Every stage of this picture on the right-hand side here involves a, a form of energy conversion and every form of piece of energy conversion involves a loss of some sort. And if you think that uh, the generation is 95% efficient, transformers are 98%, as you wander through this system, 
there's quite considerable losses all the way through here um, until you get down to the residential system. And if you add up those losses, they can become quite large. And part of our goal going forwards is to reduce those losses as much as possible. And to reduce them, you need to understand them and to be able to simulate them. So just to give you an idea, and this is, I'm sure all of you in, in here are aware of, of these facts, but they're the kinds of facts that are handy to be able to throw around at a cocktail party when nobody knows what you're talking about. In 2016, and so we're four years out of date, the amount of electrical energy used in the world was about two times 10 to the 16 watt hours, which is a very big number, and so big that nobody knows what that really means. Um, but we all understand what a double A battery is. So that is the equivalence of eight times 10 to the 15 double A batteries. Now, that's quite a large number of double A batteries, but again, there's so many double zero, so many zeros on that that most of us can't even visualize this. So I thought maybe what you should do is take one of these guys, a double A battery, and chuck it into an Olympic swimming pool and see how many you could fill with 10 to the 15 double A batteries. Uh, which is about 20 million of these guys. Uh, and that might give you some idea of what we do, um, what we're generating in the world at the moment. And if you're running, uh, let's pretend we could be 95% efficient and you're throwing away 5% of the energy, that's equivalent of a million swimming pools full of double A's in loss um, per year. If you look at gasoline, and of course we all know this when we come to transportation, uh, you only need a million Olympic swimming pools to generate for the same amount of energy. Um, and that's why we run so much gasoline. So electrical machines um, or energy conversion devices are kind of embedded in our lives. To go electric means going to electrical machines. And this is a rough pie chart of electric motors that you use. Now, another fun fact, this is a bit old, it's December 2013. We use so many electric motors that we don't even recognize that we have them. Every one of you listening probably owns or has access to four, five, six hundred electromechanical devices or electrical machines that you use on a daily basis and, and you don't even know that you have them and you acquire them at one a week. I mean, the new Mercedes S-Class car has 19 electric motors in each front seat. It has more than 30 motors in the climate control system uh, and we're not even got to the um, audio system, which is over 30 loudspeakers in the car. The, it's just unbelievable how many of these devices there are around the world. And this gives you a rough idea just in your house between air conditioning, heat pumps, furnaces, uh, dehumidifiers, refrigerators, pools, dishwashers, clothes, clothes dryers. And we haven't even got to hair dryers and um, microwave ovens and communication systems. It is just huge. And the amount of energy involved here is um 4.73 quads and i put a quad down people confuse you by using different numbers for energy and so there's a conversion number here just to help and that doesn't include your transportation so this doesn't involve your car and if we bring a car in the typical car is a motor around about 150 kilowatts and if you drive that car for one hour a day for a year you use about 5.5 times 10 to the 7 watt hours that's pretty small on the global scale um, if you now map that back onto the number I had a moment ago for the global energy production, that's uh, equivalent to 400 million vehicles being driven for an hour a day. And that sounds not bad. Um, in fact, it seems quite good. Uh, if we can run 400 million vehicles on the amount of energy we're producing right now. Um, the only problem is that there's about a billion cars on the planet at the moment, uh, which are powered by fossil fuels. And if we take those 400 million and turn them into a billion, we need almost three times the energy generation that we're producing at the moment. And that doesn't include 
industrial uses. So let's just look at what happens when you um, worry about energy supply and usage. Electrical machines, the theme of this webinar, uh, occupy about 60% of all the electrification that's going on at the moment. So these guys. Another 20% goes to transformers and you can't get away from it. Transformers are everywhere. The energy distribution system needs them and every watt hour of energy goes through one or many, probably about 10 transformers and every one of these is about 98% efficient. So you throw a watt hour in at one end and you come out with about 0.8 watt hours at the other end and the rest of it has gone into heating the world. And that of course is where the remaining 20% of the devices are where we deliberately want to heat both houses and um, industrially where induction heating uh, is a fairly common way of going on and processing materials and so on. Okay, so we've got an idea. We're going, we're going to go electric. We use an awful lot of energy. There's a huge amount of energy involved in the system and the demands are going up and up. And on those demands are not just the fact that we want more devices, we want them smaller um, as well. So if you look at the trends in device size, they're moving downwards. If you look at the number of devices you own, the trend is moving upwards. And, and this set of pictures around here um, are meant to represent some of the typical devices that you see there, medical devices, there's uh, distribution devices, there's industrial drives, up to the end here where this is a little USB uh, recharging device. It's got a little transformer built into that system there. So there's actually an electromechanical or electromagnetic device built into this uh, plug. So the pressure on us is to increase efficiency, reduce size, um, increase the ability to manufacture these things, uh, and so on and so forth. On top of that, uh, the governments are well aware, they've signed these climate accords of, of what's going on, and they are starting to impose constraints on the way you design machines and what you do with them. So legally, uh, there are now a whole pile of international standards which tell you what the minimum efficiency is that your machine must meet in order to be able to both sell it and use it. Uh, and there's a series of standards, IE1, IE2, IE3, IE4, you can look these up if you want. Um, electric motors uh, then come under this and you cannot sell them unless they fit in there. And globally, each almost every country now has regulations which constrain the sale of devices. And these are changing on an almost yearly basis. Uh, it started by high power devices being controlled and we're gradually moving down the power range. Uh, so it's soon um, anything that goes into a domestic refrigerator or whatever will have to satisfy some of these things. And you already see it in, in labels coming out on some of the domestic devices where they talk about uh, efficiency and super efficiency and so on. So having maybe got the message through that electric machines are big business and those of you in this uh, webinar will already know that and um, maybe we get we feel we don't get enough attention in the world compared to the guys working in communications electronics and so on uh, we just get on to our job just let's look at electrical machines and what is fundamental to them which is electromagnetic fields and the only thing that matters about an electromagnetic field is that it interacts with the material. In fact, they don't really exist unless materials exist. Um, and the only reason we need them is because they interact with materials. And the field really is just a, a description of the force that you get, as you all know, between electric charges. And what I don't think we do a very good job of understanding is that this is one of the strongest forces in nature. It's one of the four fundamental forces. And it's strong, and if we play around with a, a little concept, um, and I have to apologize, I dragged some of this out of Wikipedia because it seemed like a, a kind of neat fact, um, that if you just could get hold of a, a, a jug full of charges, so a whole stack of uh, 
electrons with nothing else around and you filled a four kilogram jug um, water jug um, with this stuff in that jug of four kilogram jug of water is about 2.1 times 10 to the 6 coulombs of electric charge if you took two of those jugs and put them in, jugs and put them a meter apart they would repel with a force of 10 to the 26 newtons that's quite large and if you were to weigh earth on another earth it doesn't weigh that much um, so just to give you an idea of what we're playing with luckily um, most of these charges cancel out and you can't play with that uh, so what we actually get is what sort of the few charges that are left over after all the cancellation is what we can play with and we can create spare charges but nothing at the level that, that this example would suggest the effect of those forces on the charges is obviously to create global forces and that's why we do um, electric electromagnetics and electrical machine that's the one that we want if we're building an electrical machine but unfortunately they also they don't care uh, the charges basically um, do whatever they want to do and they do it on an atomic level so you integrate up to global force but you also get local forces and those local forces can cause stresses in the structure leading to deformations of the structure um, and they can also cause losses in the material leading to heat dissipation and temperature rises in the material so this is the effect we want and the one we talk about when we design an electrical machine this one's a bit of a nuisance it causes deformation and can lead to vibration noise acoustic noise uh, which leads us to the nvh problem which is rather popular these days it also leads to potential failures of the device and there's also heat dissipation and temperature rise And what I wanted to do in this overhead is to talk a little bit more about the fact that these are truly multi-physics problems because of that force interaction at the atomic level. So we start with a system where we pour in electrical energy to create an electromagnetic field. It interacts with materials and through those interactions we get losses which generate a thermal problem giving us thermal energy out and there are situations as I said where you actually want to do this because I want to heat my house or I want to melt a material um, and we also generate forces through these materials uh, which leads us to uh, mechanical and structural problems uh, generating the mechanical energy output that we want and then of course you can connect all these other areas you can go from thermal to mechanical uh, use the forces to generate fields and fields to generate energy out so this diagram is intended to kind of show all the ways that you might want to do energy conversion and it's not complete but that the material that you play with and its behavior and the way it operates uh, or changes as you operate is critical to this uh, force and energy distribution so magnetic properties of the material are dependent on temperature and so here is a uh, temperature variation of a typical magnetic material I think this is 35 WW 300 um, this is fairly standard uh, non-oriented electrical steel used in an electrical machine and uh, what happens as the temperature goes up is that the material properties change so as we move up the scale to about 300 degrees C the maximum flux density drops out the loss changes a bit um, the saturation starts to happen a bit earlier and so on a similar problem happens in stress um, as we put in a, a compressive stress on the system the magnetic properties change dramatically uh, in fact we get more loss in the system this red curve here which is under high compressive stress increases the losses in the system um, and the magnet again the magnetization characteristics change and in the bottom one shows you what happens in tensile stress which is not quite as dramatic it also depends on the previous magnetization history and so the performance of any electric machine that we build depends on the state of the material that we're playing around with uh, and where it's been and as the machine changes in its operation as the operation conditions change so the machine the material properties change and so for example 
as the losses mount up in the machine, so you start to operate it, you're running through a drive cycle on an electric vehicle, the losses heat the machine up, its temperature rises, the temperature rises, change the magnetic properties of the material, that changes the magnetic field distribution, that field distribution changes the torque output. So as you basically heat the machine up, it changes its torque profile. And so this is a full multi-physics couple problem. And it's only in the last few years that we've been able to solve these kinds of problems. If you're looking at a power electronic system and driven from a pulse width modulated system, then you're running a high frequency control on the system and it experiences high frequency waveforms. And this is how the losses in the machine can change uh, as it experiences different excitation frequencies. So as we push the frequency up, the losses start to increase dramatically. And one of the impacts of a pulse width modulated system is that you can see increased losses inside an electrical machine. And this is not something you would have expected to see in any motor um, up to about 20 years ago because they were all sinusoidally fed. If you've got surface mounted permanent magnets, you generally put a retaining ring on and that puts the magnets under compressive stress. And we've already seen that that can create losses in the system. So you lose machine performance and that's the a curve of compressive stress we saw before. If the machine rotates at a high speed, you can get tensile stresses in the rotor, which again causes problems. So the rotor is both under compressive stress from the ring, and part of it is trying to be in tensile stress because of the forces when you're rotating at 10 or 20,000 RPM. And the force variations in the air gap can lead to structural loads on the stator, which is vibration and acoustic noise. All of this is losses, and I just want to sort of finish up this few minutes talking about hysteresis modeling, which is uh, important in non-oriented steels, but also kind of important in permanent magnet systems. Every time you take a, a material around a hysteresis loop, as you do in an electrical machine in the stator and rotor iron, you lose energy. You have to demagnetize and remagnetize that iron. You have to move those charges around, to change the domains. That's an energy loss. And that loss modifies the device performance. And this curve basically looks at what happens to a device performance if you use a material property curve in an analysis system which only believes in single values. You get the blue curve. If you put in uh, the hysteresis loss, the new model hysteresis correctly, then the torque output drops significantly. Um, you've lost energy in the magnetization process. That energy is not available for torque. And so this, the, the proper hysteresis model looks all the same, but it's a little bit down. Now, in most analyses, we would start off by assuming single value because hysteresis modeling is extremely expensive. Um, it's a time-stepping process and runs you around. And for most of the initial design, just having approximate hysteresis models is uh, which you apply after you've solved the problem in order to get the loss is good enough for the first stage. But if you want an accurate solution, then you have to model the hysteresis as part of the simulation process. So just to finish off, because I've taken too much time, um, and Mo's been very good for not inter uh, interrupting me and telling me to get on with it. Um, we live in a world where we're dependent on electromagnetic devices to maintain and develop the standard of living, and that's, that dependency is getting bigger by the day as we move into issues of um, cleaner climates, a cleaner, a cleaner world, less pollution, and so on, we're going to go more and more to electromagnetic devices. Um, but the demands are increasing on these. The efficiencies have to go up. The performance has to improve. We can't keep throwing energy away um, through inefficient devices. Um, and if we're going to stop building power stations and to look at uh, the amount of energy that we are, we, we've, that total I gave at the beginning of this talk, four years ago, the amount of energy was equivalent to about a thousand two gigawatt power stations functioning full time all year. And of course you have backups. 
as we move upwards, if we're going to electrify all our vehicles and need three times that amount of energy, plus what we've already got because it's not running vehicles, four times what we've got, we're talking of building power stations faster than you build anything else, and we can't afford to do that. We have to get rid of the energy losses as much as we can uh, so we can reduce the rate at which we're building generation systems. Wind and tide and solar are great, but they're going to have, an, unless we, everybody wants a wind generator in their backyard, um, we're not going to do this, we just wind. So to build a machine properly, to get its performance right, you need the materials, the material understanding, we need to understand how it changes as the machine runs. Um, so the bottom line here, and this is meant to be my introduction to Mo's talk, designing a modern electrical machine needs sophisticated analysis and design tools, which not only predict the nominal performance of the machine, but also simulate how it varies during its lifetime and during, in the case of a car, a typical drive cycle. And that leads us to what at Siemens we talk a lot about these days, and that's the concept of a digital twin. Um, and But that's a whole different area for future talks and, and so on. So at that point, I'd like to stop and say thank you to Mo for letting me go on, and let's get into something a little bit more serious at this point. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Professor, for the amazing presentation. And uh, it's been an honor having you with us. Um, so let me just get the control. OK, perfect. So companies, new and traditional automakers, are racing to electrify their electric vehicle portfolio with rapidly growing consumer interests in electric vehicles and rapidly decreasing total costs of ownerships for those electric vehicles and uh, and therefore gaining market share in electric vehicle space is now critical to companies existence in the near future so uh dan why don't you go ahead and start the first poll for the session excellent will do and while i get that started again thank you so much professor lather for that fantastic presentation definitely brought me back to, to where we were in class a few years ago, but also for adding on the critical role you have with Siemens. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch the first polling question. You should be able to see it now. So I'll read it out in case you're having any issues, but what is your number one challenge for electric vehicles? Range, cost, reliability. Now, if, if you think it's, it's other, feel free to put in the bucket that you think it's, it's most likely going to be in but we'd appreciate if you take a couple of seconds and just fill this out for us. I'm also excited for, for Mohammed to be able to cover these points as he goes through the rest of the presentation and how to improve reliability, decrease costs, and, and help increase range. So we'll give it just another 10 seconds or so. Just go ahead again, use your best guess. If you aren't too sure about your organization, you can speak to it on a more personal level as well. Great, with that, we go ahead and close the poll. Great, so in terms of results that we're seeing for the number one challenge, Majority respondents really feel like it goes back to costs and, and, and really back in time to a lot of different areas, whether we're looking at testing, initial development, manufacturing, a lot of different areas, but really cost seems to be the bear the burden here. Uh, range, interestingly enough, is, is the second choice here with 30% of respondents. I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll address that to an extent, but that may need to be part of a follow-up activity. And finally, a small number of respondents do feel that reliability is is one of the the number is the number one challenge for them. So, Mo, I think this lines up with with some of the other feedback we're seeing with with clients that we're working on across multiple of these problems. But I'll pass it back to you so that you can bring us through what that looks like in terms of design and simulation. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for the attendees for filling up the poll. And yes, cost is one of the trending challenges in 
vehicle electrification. Whenever we talk about electric vehicle costs, initially when electric vehicles started, the price was so high because of the components used to build the batteries, to build the, the technology for uh, interfacing the electric vehicle performance with the control, with the driver, those components were extremely expensive. And as a result, the cost is very, very high. But nowadays, the range anxiety is the number one challenge in electric vehicle electrification. Bigger batteries are not the solution due to the cost associated. Moreover, bigger battery translates to a heavier vehicle, which turns uh, in the uh, which is which in turn is reflected as a bigger powertrain to hold the vehicle. Therefore, weight reduction is a key to improving the range and efficiency. And there are many examples of such practices in the industry. For example, let's take a look at the second generation Nissan Leaf where Nissan managed to increase the range by almost 50% by weight reduction, uh, uh, weight optimization and reduction and better component integration. The design optimization enables you to reduce the amount of material required in your parts, reducing your material costs, minimizing the component weight while meeting re the requirements for performance, safety and reliability. And during this session, we will address this challenge using design uh, optimization driven designs and analysis to address weight reduction issues in electric vehicles namely in the powertrain and the design of electric motors but before we go into the technicalities let's discuss the factors affecting the reliability and the lifetime of a traction motor we can define the surface life of a traction motor according to the Freedom Car 2020 targets. And the Freedom Car 2020 targets is the standard that was uh, done by a research institute and the Department of uh, uh, Energy in, in the United States, and you can look it up. Anyhow, based on those standards, we can look at uh, uh, the load, uh, the speed torque profiles of a traction motor. Under continuous duty, under continuous operation, the motor does not exceed its temperature limit. And while operating in the intermittent duty region, the motor is limited by its thermal capacity and thermal limit. According to the Freedom Car 2020 targets, the motor should deliver 30 kilowatts of continuous power for 15 years. In addition, it should, it should sustain short bursts of 55 kilowatt peak power for 18 seconds, while, uh, which is basically thermal cycling. So if you look at the, the, the load profile, you're going to see you're no, the motor is not just pro, um, needed to provide a continuous torque, but it also needs to sustain acceleration and deceleration. And that's a, uh, 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 so in conclusion, a traction motor should deliver 30 kilowatts of continuous power and sustain 55 kilowatt of, uh, uh, of peak power for 18 seconds for 15 years over the whole torque speed region. So what are some of the factors that reduce a motor service life we start off with motor loading this is an example of a drive a, a drive cycle it shows that the traction motor will experience frequent starts and stops as well as continuous acceleration and deceleration in addition to the high inertial mechanical cycling loads so the traction motor is connected to the full inertia of the vehicle and is experiences those experiencing those acceleration and deceleration. This operation and this type of operation needs uh, uh, and the need to meet the peak acceleration torques in the motor mode and decelerating torques in the regenerative braking mode will result in thermal cycling, and that that will accelerate the mode, the traction motor aging. The second factor is the insulation life a motor's life is also based on the classes of the motor insulator used to build it as seen from the graph we can reach two conclusions number one for a given winding temperature limit the higher the class the higher the service life and two as the winding temperature in a given class increases the service life decreases dramatically Therefore, a motor's temperature limit and its insulation class determines its peak torque capability and service life. As a result, the motor should be of a higher insulation class and of the highest possible temperature limit. 
And this brings us to the topic about ambient temperature. What happens to the motor? A traction motor is required to operate from as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius to a peak of 105 degrees Celsius according to the Freedom Car 2020 targets. So now let's assume a motor with a class H insulation with a thermal limit of 180 degrees Celsius. As seen in the bar graph, as the ambient temperature increases, the permissible temperature rise due to loading decreases. Therefore, to meet the same load torques at higher ambient temperature, the motor will operate at elevated temperatures. And it's there, uh, and there is insufficient cooling. And if there is insufficient cooling, its service life would be reduced. Also, EV motors are mainly permanent magnet machines due to their higher power densities. So what does that mean? It means one, higher power densities reduce the motor thermal mass. Hence, the motors are prone to higher temperatures and thermal cycling. We also know that the permanent magnets degrade with an increase in temperature. And in the graph, we can see that the, uh, the de demagnetization characteristics of this particular magnet is degraded significantly at 180 degrees Celsius. And magnets can also be demagnetized by opposing fields. And this graph, for example, shows a progression of the magnet's characteristics. When a sinusoidal field is applied to a magnet, in every half cycle, the external fields pushes the magnet below the knee point, making it to recoil in a new but lower characteristics, which progressively demagnetizes the magnet. In conclusion then, the choice of the magnet material is the most important aspect in traction motor design. And this is because one, it will lower the temperature limit for the motor, hence it peak torque capability. Number two, magnetization loss is permanent for high energy permanent magnet motors, which in severe circumstances would require a motor replacement. So this brings us to the question on how can we analyze the magnetization in simulations accurately? To address the challenge, we're going to build up a case by taking into account uh, a, a traction motor. So let's start by introducing our traction motor used for this analysis in this session. Uh, it's based on the 20, uh, 2010 uh, a Toyota Prius electrical motor as published by the Oak Ridge National Lab and Professor Jim Hendershot. The objective here is to optimize the design and reduce the magnet volume while maintaining the required performance to meet the Freedom Car standards, as well as the safety and reliability. So the motor consists of 48 slots, 8 pole, uh, uh, IPM machine. Uh, the key factor we need to notice here from this table is that the magnet volume uh, that we are, uh, our objective is to minimize this magnet volume and reduce the weight and maintain the performance required by the peak torque and uh, the peak power. So to achieve our objectives, we're going to break down the technical roadmap or the technical work into three main uh, steps. The first step is the design inputs. And this is usually, in our case, we're basing our design based on a, 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 a traction motor that is already designed. But uh, in other cases, you might need to design the motor in the first place. So. When designing the motor, you have to take into account the peak power requirements, the electrical drive that is gonna be connected to the machine, the geometry and the materials used for that specific design, as well as the stator windings and materials and so on. From there, we go into the design optimization where we take a look at the performance. For this specific case, we're looking at the performance and the magnet volume. So we have two competing objectives. We would like to minimize the magnet volume while maintaining the performance. And at the same time, we'd like to minimize the cogging torque to make sure that the electric machine that we're designing is as smooth as possible. And the last step, we're gonna go into the multi-physics designs. So we're gonna take a look at the demagnetization analysis, a detailed demagnetization analysis, some uh, uh, eccentricity analysis and CFD analysis as well. So, so to start off by the design inputs, Again, this is the machine that we're doing. Uh, it's um, a 60 kilowatt machine uh, with developing 205 Newton meter at uh, 3000 RPM. Uh, the magnet volume is the same. It's a three phase winding, distributed winding with uh, lap winding, one coil per pole per phase, uh, single layer winding, uh, 11 turns per coil and 12 strands in hands. 
So before we jump into the tool and see how we can first establish the baseline design, let's take another quick poll question. And then if you could be kind enough to run the second poll question. Absolutely, we'll do Mo. So great, it should be showing up on your on your screen right now. So the second poll question, how many design variations do you consider before reaching a final design? There's four options here for us. So firstly, no design variation. Second, less than five, third, less than ten, or let's say between five and ten. And finally, more than 15. Please just take a couple of seconds. Again, you don't need to know the exact number, but just to give us an idea as to how many we're looking at. I suspect we'll uh, see either sort of a split and the variation here. We'll give it just 10 more seconds, just in the keeping timing in mind, as we'd like to leave some time at the end for questions. Great. That I'll go ahead and wrap up the poll. So good to know that everyone has some form of design variations going on, but majority are looking at, at doing more than 15. And quite a few are still looking at, at between five, five to 10, um, with a couple doing less than five. So again, we are seeing a certain number of design variations. I think depending on the complexity, we, we see a lot more skewing towards more than 15. Of course, we're not looking at specific cases here, but this gives us an idea as to how the audience skews. So with that, Mo, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, thank you, Dan. And thank you for uh, the attendees of filling the poll. So this is expected. Having design variations is something very important early in the design stage to make sure that you get the design right from the first time. And usually when you're looking into building different designs, there are many factors that you have to take into account. One of them being the time needed to build those variations. So it's either it's going to be autom uh, automated somehow where you make the changes to the software and the software will automatically make those changes and have the different variations. So that's the first one, the time limitation. The second one is when you build all your design variations and now you start solving those designs, there are some limitation again in time and also in licensing. So uh, at the given location, at the given company, you might not have enough licenses to run all the designs at one time. So you're going to have to uh, do them in series. And this essentially, you have to babysit the simulation. You have to make sure that you're not running into any design errors and so on. So all this is being said because I want to show you how we can leverage the tools that we already have within the Siemens portfolio to optimize the variation and to, to optimize the optimization and to address what we call the intelligent design exploration. So with that, let me jump into the tool quickly. As you can see my screen, this is the machine that we're working on. This is the baseline machine. This is the design that we're going to optimize to minimize the magnet volume while maintaining the performance. So let's address the key features of the design. One of, the, one of them being the winding. So usually the winding is developed uh, in-house or it's part of the design. And uh, the key features is you're trying to come up with uh, uh, innovative design, uh, winding designs to minimize the winding factor, to minimize the harmonics, to address certain balance issues, to uh, different types of techniques when designing uh, the winding diagram. Once you have that set, the next step would be, of course, is to set up the, make sure that your design is working, make sure that you have, <clears throat> excuse me, your resistance is calculated and, and, and making sure the results. So let's start by just building a quick set of results and overview our design. So looking at the, uh, uh, the results, we can see that the machine is operating in the motor mode at 3000 RPM, generating uh, uh, 204 uh, Newton meter with uh, about 60 ki 65 kilowatt power at a 94% efficiency. And the thing to note here is that uh, we also have a measurement for the magnet volume used in the magnets. So how can we set up the optimization? And again, we're gonna leverage the tools that are already available within the portfolio, within this tool, which is called speed. We're gonna leverage heads within speed. This, to set up the problem, it's extremely easy. 
you have to set up your input parameters which we leverage the fact that speed is being uh, analytical you have access to all the design parameters all you have to do is simply select the the, the parameter from the drop down list that you would like to optimize or you like to optimize it to change and variate once you select it you select the minimum and maximum values where you'd like the 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 parameter to change in and the resolution of the change so how many data points between the minimum and maximum you'd like to select and also it's important to highlight how many maximum iterations we're doing so for this specific case we're not testing five we're not testing 15 we're testing 1500 designs changing eight parameters in the rotor geometry to minimize the magnets while maintaining the performance so those are the input parameters that we're using there are eight input parameters used on the rotor geometry to minimize to to essentially minimize the cogging torque as well as to apply some constraints the constraint applying to the optimizer in this case are the shaft the shaft power should not drop below 64 kilowatt the back emf uh, should fall between 120 volts and 135 volts because if we're reducing the magnet volume we have to make sure that we're still operating in the range for uh, the electrical drive connected to the machine and at the same time if we reduce the magnets to the point where we're still maintaining the performance we are putting ourselves at a higher risk for demagnetization because with the magnets being thinner than they should be we risk magnetization so once setting those designs together and setting all the inputs all you have to do is run the study and I, I have the results already from this so let's run the analysis and see the results so you can see that we've tested 1500 designs with four error designs and the design sets are broken into three sets infeasible designs feasible designs and error designs and the idea here is that whenever the optimizer generates a design that violates one of the constraints it classifies that design as an infeasible design and whenever it generates a configuration that uh, for some reason doesn't make sense from an electromagnetic standpoint why other um, could be the the tooth width too small or for the for specific for the changes that we made here the uh, the magnet arc is too small or too big to fit in the in the rotor so those are labeled as error designs so whenever the optimizer encounters an error design it doesn't stop the process it simply labels it as an error designs and go uh, to check the other designs so based on this process we end up with 637 feasible designs out of the uh, 1500 designs and if we look at those designs we have a huge list of all the designs that uh, we label them as feasible designs and if we do a simple sorting by the user variable in this case which is the magnet volume we can see that we already have promising results while maintaining for example if we take a look at the top five designs we're reducing the magnet volume maintaining the shaft and also reducing the cogging torque and it also gives us the settings for those designs that generated the design and the good thing is if we look at the design we can show the model of the design that gave us that specific uh, uh, the best design of course the one that we select and again this tool is directly accessible from from within speed as the, the designer and you can test it only requires one license so you don't have to worry about licensing issues you don't have to worry about babysitting the simulation it will automatically classify the designs based on the constraints that you give it and the objective functions that you specify for the optimizer so again let's go back and jump to the presentation and take into account the top five designs that we built so moving on this is a summary of what we did essentially we have eight rotor geometrical parameters if you look at the design of the rotor you can see on the top right corner and we're changing all the design parameters that control the shape of the rotor to minimize the magnet volume we're uh, subjugating the uh, the constraint to the, the objective function to three constraints the shaft power the back emf and the magnet volume of course and we as i mentioned we're uh, considering 1500 design iterations 
With that, looking at the top five results, we can see that uh, there is a significant reduction in the magnet volume while maintaining the same performance, which it could, could at least we can say that we were able to achieve a 13% reduction in the magnet volume. And this is extremely important to highlight because a 13% reduction in the magnet volume corresponds to a lighter lighter machine, corresponds to, uh, I apologize, uh, one second, sorry about that. Uh, so the 13% reduction corresponds to a lighter machine, corresponds to a shipping cost of the units are now less because of the weight, so it's extremely important to, to try to achieve those types of weight reductions and optimization while maintaining the same performance. So from there, we have to go, of course, and jump and discuss the multi-physics designs. Uh, and as Professor Lauder mentioned, it's now it's becoming more important to look at the multi-physics design. So Dan, uh, let's start our final poll of the session. And uh, Excellent. I'll pass it back to you. Excellent. I agree, Mo. I think the multi-physics portion is, is critical as we're looking at further optimizing and simulating. So the question goes, what other physics do you take into account when designing an electric motor? So there, there's three here in terms of options, just EMAG, second EMAG and thermal, or third EMAG and NVH, noise, vibration, harshness. So please just take a, a couple of seconds and, and give us your insight here. We'd love to hear what you're looking to simulate right now, this will also help as Mo gets into some of the multi-physics capabilities that, that he's able to cover um, over the remainder of the presentation as we look to wrap up. All right, seeing about 50% of attendees have already voted. If you can, let's just take a, another couple of seconds to wrap up here. All right. And I'm just going to wrap up the poll now. So in terms of sharing, and again, they, they do round off some of these numbers, so that would explain why it doesn't fully add up. But again, the majority of, of the audience attendees are looking at, at taking into account EMAG and thermal. There's a few that aren't looking at thermal at all or are just looking at EMAG. But again, the majority are taking into are taking thermal considerations into account, which are which are quite important. So, Mo, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to you, so that you can bring us through the last stretch of the presentation. Take it away. Thank you, thank you, Dan. And as expected, the results uh, mainly point towards EMAG and thermal. And I have to um, I have to know here from our experience, and this is where we see most of the customers. Um, I don't want to say fall short, but don't take into account other physics. And as Professor, Professor Lauder mentioned, electric machine design or motor design is a true multi-physics problem. Even if you take into account EMAG and thermal, you're still neglecting the, 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 the structural side of the, the, of the story. And if you're doing the thermal design, you might be doing it just to know the temperatures. You can also be, uh, be designing the uh, cooling system used. So the true multi-physics design the motor design is a true multi-physics problem and you have to take into account all the physics possible to make sure that you're building a reliable machine uh, a machine that is competitive with a reasonable price point so to, to essentially to continue in the same vein you have to build your electric machine design but the corner store for this uh, design of course is going to be the electromagnetic analysis so you no longer just need to do the electromagnetic analysis, as I mentioned. You need to be able to do thermal analysis on your design to take into account the coupled nature uh, of the material properties between thermal and electromagnetics. You also take in, you need to take into account the structural integrity of your design, especially in the electric vehicle domain, uh, when it comes to the structural integrity and uh, uh, meeting the re performance requirements for the entire vehicle. Also, the vibroacoustic analysis, because as you know, the internal combustion engine used to mask a lot of the noises generated by the car. However, nowadays, because of you don't have the masking noise, 
the noises that comes from the electric machines, from the transmission lines, all of these become very significant and dominant. We have to take into account the vibroacoustic and it's getting, uh, it's becoming more and more popular as we progress in, in, in get, and, and we're essentially exploring new techniques in the electric vehicle industry. And the last thing, of course, is the cooling of the electric vehicle. So considering those designs is not just important, it's extremely important to have it also tied in with an intelligent design exploration. So you have to tie in all those physics. When you make a change in the design, you have to take account the other physics and making sure that you're considering as many design variations early in the design stage before building your prototypes to save from uh, building the prototype cost and making sure you're building a, uh, uh, um, building a competitive design. So with that being said, let's jump into the technical side or the multi-physics designs where we'll be looking at three different types of analysis. A detailed demagnetization analysis, we're looking into two domains, the load current demagnetization and the thermal demagnetization. We're also looking at uh, eccentricity analysis for NVH where we're using the native functionalities in SimCenter Magnet uh, uh, to essentially calculate the force, uh, the surface nodal force that you can then map to your structural analysis to get the NVH analysis. Also, we're looking into the cooling and CFD to optimize the cooling technique, because as we're going to see, we're going to use some of the results from the demagnetization analysis to drive the cooling system uh, design and sizing. So to start off with the current demagnetization due to the increase in low torque from 100 Newton meter to 200 Newton meter at 120 degrees Celsius. This requires the current to be ramped up as seen in the chart, which results in a corresponding increase in torque. Now let's see the state of the magnets before and after the increase, the increasing current. At five milliseconds, we can see that the magnets are not demagnetized. And at 20 milliseconds, there is a partial demagnetization which lowers the torque by 4%. So, what is happening to our magnets in the partially demagnetized region? To investigate this, we're going to break the BH loop and the currents into stages. So, in the first stage, the magnetized model and the non-demag model will recoil at the same characteristics. So, if we take the design, ignore the demagnetization and take the demagnetization into account, uh, in stage one, we see that the demag and non-demag models recoil at the same characteristics. In stage two, the current is ramped up, as you can see from the graph on the top left corner. Uh, uh, the current is increasing. So for the demag model, this is progressive demagnetization as the material is pushed below the knee point and recoils in a new but lower characteristics at every time. And in the final stage, uh, the current settles at the higher current value. Hence, the DMAG model recoils in the new lower characteristics than in state two. And this is important in the analysis of permanent magnet traction motors under all conditions, particularly under acceleration, which requires the motor to be momentarily overloaded. The non DMAG model is linear and does not account for field demagnetization, but it is temperature dependent and it always recoils on the same characteristics as seen, as seen from the blue line. Uh, and this will result in overestimation of the performance. So now let's see the case of reducing the load. In the case where the torque is reduced from 200 Newton meters to 100 Newton meters at 20 degrees Celsius, at five milliseconds, we can see that the magnets are already demagnetized by the high load current. And at 20 milliseconds, the same portions of the magnets are confirmed to be permanently demagnetized. And SimCenter magnet can therefore simulate the effects of permanent demagnetization loss, which lowers the motor torque and density. And uh, if the loss is severe, the motor would need to be replaced since high energy magnets like new, for example, cannot be magnetized on the fly. And of course, let's check the magnet characteristics at the same sampling point that we have here at the uh, center of the magnets. When the magnet recoils at the lower characteristics, it's a good indicator that the permanent magnet is demagnetized from the three sections. So breaking down the current into three sections, we can see now since 
we're starting off with the high load current. This automatically pushes the DMAG model to recoil at the same stages for stage one and stage two, and all the stages essentially fall into the same uh, uh, BH loop, which indicates a total or a permanent demagnetization loss. And of course, the second scenario is the thermal demagnetization under load demand. And I will consider an increase in torque from 100 Newton meter to 200 Newton meter, taking into account a temperature rise from 120 degrees Celsius to 150 degrees Celsius. So we're taking both factors into account. Then, uh, and of course, we're increasing the current to take into account the change and also looking at just the DMAG model. So under the non-DMAG model, which is the blue one, the effect of the temperature is minimal. And it's about 2% overall reduction in the torque. And this is because of the slight difference in the magnet characteristics at the two temperatures. Also remember that the non-DMAG model does not account for the field demagnetization, and it always recoils at the same characteristics for a given measure. And that is it neglects the currents of field uh, demagnetization. Under the DMAG model, the effect of both higher temperature and current is very significant, and it results in a 27% reduction in torque. And this is because a combination of both higher temperature and current that lowers the field required to demagnetize the magnets significantly. And in this case, we can see from the graph on the uh, bottom left corner that it goes from A and B as seen in the nonlinear demagnetization. So the knee point shifts significantly from the A position to the B position. And therefore, operating a, a permanent magnet machine at extreme temperatures will severely and permanently degrade permanent magnet machines. So now we look at the magnet state before and after the demagnetization. And for the demagnetization case, which was significantly affected by the demagnetization, at five millisecond, we see that the magnets are not significantly demagnetized, just around the corners and the edges, which is expected. But at 20, degree, uh, 20 milliseconds, there is a severe, severe demagnetization, you can see all across the magnets. And this results in the 27 reduction in the torque, and therefore the motor must be replaced at that point. So to conclude, we have to make sure that our traction motor operates within the expected drain, uh, range of power and also maintaining the temperature at 120 degrees Celsius. So the MVH behavior of electric machines on electric vehicles is significantly different when compared with traditional cars. The lack of masking from combustion engine makes road and wind noise much more important. And uh, auxiliary systems like the edge track system, the power steering, and even the wiper motor are so all of a sudden very audible. In addition to the powertrain, the powertrain must be quieter, but at the higher frequency noise tone uh, and uh, originating from the electronics and the drive running the machine are extremely significant. And uh, many places around the world are now placing standards to limit the noise emitted uh, from those types of electric vehicles. And it's extremely important to take it into the design, not only just looking at the motor itself, but you have to be looking at the road noise, looking at the HVAC system, wind noise, electric motor, and uh, uh, the warning sounds around the vehicle. And uh, of course, we, uh, we progress to the final section of uh, the presentation where we discuss the cooling. And as we mentioned from the detailed demag uh, demagnetization analysis, we have to maintain, for that given motor, we have to maintain the temperature in the windings at 120 degrees Celsius or even below. So what we're going to do here in this case, we're going to export the heat losses from the electromagnetic analysis and the demagnetization analysis. And of course, we, we've been using Simpsonter magnet. And then we're going to be mapping those heat components, uh, heat losses at sources, at heat sources for the different components in the design. And from there, we're going to optimize the cooling, this, uh, uh, the cooling system. So let's see exactly how that looks like. We're going to start by having exactly the 3D model representation of the design, setting up the computation domain for the fluids, making sure that we have the components and assigning the, the fluid subdomains. From there, of course, we're going to define the materials used in the design, setting the inlet and outlet of the cooling, 
liquid that's going to cool the windings and mapping the heat sources from the electromagnetic analysis to the components and our goal of course is to is to minimize the temperature to make sure that it falls under a, a given 120 degrees celsius so let's establish the baseline and look at the results without any cooling optimization so just building the results and let's see the definitions so we're going to be looking into two results the temperature and the pressure drop so the temperature is already at 146 degrees celsius which is well above the level that we need which is pushing us to more towards the 27 percent reduction in the torque so we have to optimize the cooling techniques and what we're doing in this model for example here we're optimizing the pins in the cooling techniques and uh, uh, the pin count and the pin diameter how they look and how many there are in the design to op essentially to meet the objectives so what we're going to do is we're going to set up the same optimizer that we use to generate the electromagnetic analysis and to study the 1500 designs the same optimizer we're going to use it to minimize the temperature so we all you have to do now is just import uh, the files from uh, uh, the simulation the cooling simulation allow the optimizer to auto tag the variables that we're changing in this case the pin count and the pin shape and also assign the expected outputs at the temperature and the pressure drop and as you can see the optimizer automatically assigns and tags those inputs and also the responses which are the temperatures and the voltage drop and the pressure drop i'm sorry and then we're setting the multi objective trade-off where we're considering 40 designs just uh, uh, to make it a little bit easier and uh, then we're setting up the objectives by simply dragging and dropping from the responses to the objectives is our objective to minimize the temperature and minimize the voltage uh, the the pressure drop and setting a restriction on the uh, uh or the pressure drop not to go uh below a given value or not, not to exceed a given value and all we have to do next is run the study and once with that we run the study the exact same interface uh, uh it just shows us as it progresses what's the infeasible designs what are the error designs and what are feasible designs so at the end we end up with 27 feasible designs and 13 infeasible designs violating one of the constraints uh, we we were looking at the different data in the parallel plots where we we're viewing in the uh, uh, x-axis the different uh, responses and each line represents a design and we're also looking at each uh, uh, of those designs and now we're going to map those results back into the design and see the performance of the system how it impacts the change so doing the analysis and simulating the uh, results and looking at the results we can see now the temperature falls to 100 um, from the initial design to 119 uh, degrees celsius which is well below the the uh, the uh, current the the rated temperature which amounts for 20 percent reduction uh, in the shape and this is the final cooling system so with the intelligent design exploration techniques and the ability to couple the multi physics together and looking at all those physics as one design process for the electric machine we were able to design the electric machine optimize the design consider uh, 1500 designs look at the required temperature operate uh, the required uh, operating temperature from the demagnetization analysis and then size the cooling system based on the demagnetization analysis and as a result to end up with the winding temperature at 100 uh, at 119 degrees celsius so in summary in this presentation we have looked at the effect of demagnetization on permanent magnet traction motors that can be gener uh, generalized to other permanent magnet machines across all industries not just the transportation but also in the aerospace and defense in marine and every design as uh, every industry and as professor Lauder, men Lauder mentioned at the beginning of the webinar we always uh, come across electric machines without even knowing so uh, the service life depends on the design which should account for demagnetization and from both load currents and temperature and also the choice of the magnetic material is also important as magnetization loss in high energy permanent magnets is permanent 
and uh, we cannot magnetize those magnets back on the fly so we have to replace the machine and this of course requires accurate demagnetization simulations that can reproduce a motor operating operation at extreme conditions then we looked at the effect of overloading and thermal demagnetization and the scenario had the highest reduction in torque uh, was at uh, a 27 percent reduction of torque but note that it's closely tied to the magnetic properties at different temperatures Ideally, we want the knee point at the motor temperature to uh, 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 the temperature limit to be in the third quadrant of the BH loop and the, and the characteristics to be linear in the second quadrant. In addition, in addition, we want the effect of temperature to be negligible. And this brings us to the end of this presentation. And thank you for tuning in. And Dan, I pass it back to you if you have uh, uh, any questions that we need to answer. Perfect. Thanks, Mo. What wonderful summary and presentation as well. We did have a question specifically on, on the example that you used, so maybe we'll start with that. Uh, so you only considered the magnet shape for your optimization, or did you use higher current density in your motor to achieve your target torque after the magnet reduction? No, I, I don't know if you can talk a bit about the optimization. Go ahead, yes, Mo. Definitely. So we only took into, let me just jump to that slide. We didn't change anything into the current density and we can bring that up from the simulation. I just want to get to this slide. The only parameters that we changed are all geometric analysis. So with the magnet length, the magnet arc, the inset, which is called web, and uh, different types of geometry for that particular uh, template in, in speed, uh, and also L web and C web. And the uh, width of the magnet and the bridge so it's all geometrical analysis we didn't change the excitation and i can bring up the simulation uh here uh, as you can see in the control Great. section we're keeping the same current we're not exchanging the value and this is the baseline design of course and we can open uh the actual design and Mo, just while you're there, what's the current density that you're using for the simulations? Okay, let's uh, take a quick look at the current density. Uh, it's 18.5 ampere per millimeter cube. Okay, excellent, yes. thanks. Those are the questions we had specifically uh, on the example that you, you, changed, you shared. Yes. Another one for you, Mo, uh, what happens if the optimizer generates a design error while exploring so all it has to do is just label that design as an error design and simply jump to the next one so if we look at this design we have uh, four error designs that were just labeled as error designs and ignored and essentially skipped to the other one to the next design excellent i think while we're on that when it comes to data exchange between the optimizer and the and the motor design tool how does how does that data exchange work and and are you able to add more tools to the optimization loop yes definitely so the first part of the question is the data transition and the data transition is all automated within speed all you have to do is just call the optimizer and he, this interface comes up where you again select the variables that you'd like to change from all the accessible parameters in the design uh, change the minimum and maximum settings for the bounds and the constraints and, and essentially set your objective function and run the analysis and then the communication between the optimizer and speed is done automatically and the second part of the question can we add more to the design yes mm -hmm. you can add more uh, uh, steps and more studies to the optimizer and this is uh, what we call a study uh, and each study has portals that we take into account how many connection how many uh, um, softwares you would like to connect to the optimizer so it connects with Siemens tools and non Siemens tools and and essentially it's open uh, for the user to set the limits for the optimization excellent thank you Mo and I think I have one last one for you here if we're able to bring this the simulation up to a higher level and if we start looking at it from a systems perspective um, how can or are you able to use system simulation tools to even size the motor or will you have to use a dedicated tool can you speak to that 
Yes, definitely. Sizing the motor uh, can definitely uh, be done in the system simulation tool. And actually, this brings up uh, uh, an interesting question. So next week's session is going to be with my colleague, Anthony, who's going to address the system level uh, uh, vehicle electrification from a system level point of view, where we're looking at the component sizing and component integration. And one of those components that we can leverage system simulation tools to size is the electrical motor or the powertrain in general. So this is something that could definitely be done. And my colleague Anthony next week, Tuesday next week, will be able to answer those questions with a very detailed uh, presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mo. I think with that, we've wrapped up the questions. Once again, I would like to thank Professor Lowther and Mo for their wonderful presentations. I think it set the right amount of context and understanding the, the importance of these tools and, and these processes, and as well as being able to do a deeper dive. In terms of what's next, I mentioned we'll share the recording and presentation material that you're seeing here. Uh, in addition, if you'd like to get your hands on these tools or if you have, let's say, a design or simulation problem you'd want to explore with us, don't hesitate to send Mo a note or, or email back once we get the material out to you. We'd be happy to try to see how to, how to best resolve that or even get the tools in your hands. Uh, that's what our team is here for. So. With that, we're looking to wrap up. Please join us next week on, on the systems analysis presentation that, that Mo was alluding to towards the end. For those in the US, have a fantastic Thanksgiving week and weekend, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you all so much. Bye now.